Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys this morning? Amen. Why don't we start the day the right way? Let's give our neighbors a nice greeting with a hug or a handshake this morning. How about a wave? Okay, well, I know that, uh, that we have a, a holiday weekend upon us, and I'm sure some of us are, who are normally here are out camping this week, and, uh, you know, I, I would say let's not be, be jealous of that. I say let's have a, such a great time in here that they'd be jealous of us for missing it. <laughs> and uh, I just know God's going to do great things in this place this morning. Really quickly, too, there are some extra special little things in our seat backs there. If you can, uh, if you can see that behind you, there's a little thing for, for some sermon notes and visitor cards and, and whatnot, all, all kind of redone and revamped. So if you're new here too, please make sure you fill one of those out and put it in our offering before you leave today. And uh, before we get into our worship service, let's go ahead and come to our Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you do for us in this place, Lord. We thank you for everybody that is here. We thank you for everybody that is joining us online today as well. Thank you just for for wanting to, for their, their hearts just wanting to be in your presence this morning, God, wherever they may be, Lord. We just want to give you praise. We want to just shout our worship to the heavens this morning, God, so it's pleasing to you, Lord. And this in your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, let's go ahead and worship. nothing for me this life is not my own i know you go before me and i am not alone this mountain rises higher the way seems so unclear but i know that you go with me so i will never fear and i will trust in you Whatever will come my way Through fire or pouring rain No, we won't be shaken We won't be shaken Whatever tomorrow brings Together we'll rise and say That we won't be shaken Fire up for him. 
for a moment. Oops. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. They ended that quicker than I thought. I'm a little late getting up here. Good to see you all this morning. Good to be seen. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> How many of you remember uh, the little uh, phrase WWJD? How many remember that? Raise your hands. You, re you remember that they had the little uh, bracelets on it and they had, all, had that all over everything, WWJD, which stood for what did Jesus, what would Jesus do? Sorry. There we go. <laughs> <clears throat> what? Uh, who let him in the front row? <laughs> so I'm going to start a new one. It is WDJS. What did Jesus say? Now, if you're wondering what Jesus said in your Bibles, in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you read through those, everything that's in red is what Jesus said. Jesus had a lot to say. In fact, uh, John in, his, in uh, his Gospel said that if everything that Jesus had done or said had been written down, not enough books in the world to contain it all. But I want to focus on specific things that Jesus said and how we can apply that to our lives. In, uh, just a second, I gotta get my cheat sheet out here. In John 6, 28 and 29, Jesus had just walked across the water the night before and ended up on the other side of the, the uh, Sea of Galilee. And the people, didn't see him get on a boat. In fact, this is after the Sermon on the Mount, and they, didn't, they hadn't seen him get on the boat. So they come around, and they're looking for him, and they find him, and they, say, they ask him, how did you get here? And he replies to them, he says, the only reason you're looking for me is because I fed you the day before. You know, with the, he fed the 5,000 with the fish and loaves. He said, the only reason you're looking for me is because you're, you're looking for bread. And he says, I'm telling you, you need to look for the bread of, bread of life and do the work that the Father commands you. And so they ask him. In John 6, 28 and 29, they ask him, so what is the work of the Father? And Jesus replied, the work of the Father is to believe him who he sent. Okay. So then, in another place, in John 14, 21, Jesus says, whoever has my commandments and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Okay. Okay. Then again in John 5, 24, just a second, it'll come to me. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Whoever believes my words, no, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Then one of my most favorite verses in the whole Bible is Luke 23, 42 and 43. Jesus is hanging on the cross between the two thieves. The one thief has mocked him and says, well, if you're the, if you're the, the Lord, if you're the Messiah, save yourself and, and us. And the other one told him, 
hey, we are getting what we deserve. This man has done nothing wrong. And then he said this. He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus tell him? Jesus says, I tell you this day you will be with me in paradise. What is the only right thing that that thief did? He believed. He believed that Jesus was who he said he was and that Jesus could, in fact, save him. He didn't confess. <laughs> he knew that God knew who he was. All he did was say, ask, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And based on his belief and his belief alone, Jesus promised him he would be in paradise that day with him. Jesus. How simple can it be? Just believe. Just believe. And how do you know if somebody believes? Because they act accordingly. I know that Jim down here believes in gravity because you don't see him jumping off no roofs. I know that you believe that you can be hurt by a speeding car because you don't jump out in front of them. If you believe, act accordingly. What was it Jesus said? He said, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. Now, the reason we can believe and trust Jesus' words is because of how he demonstrated his love for us. And that's why we do communion. On the night before he was arrested and crucified, he was with his disciples, and they were having this, the Passover meal together. And at one point, he took the bread, which fell off in my pocket, and, and he broke the bread, and he blessed it, and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat. He then took the cup, blessed it, and said, this is my blood, which is poured out for the salvation of many. Take and drink. Father God, we thank you, we praise you, we believe you. Lord God, thank you that you loved us so much that you died in our place. It's because of your sacrifice that if we believe, we have eternal life and are not condemned. We have crossed over from death to life. We thank you and praise you for that, Jesus. In your holy name we pray, amen. amen. As we uh, think about uh, our tithes and offerings, I just want to tell you what uh, Proverbs says. Now this might be a little bit of a, uh, I might be taking some license with what it says, but it says, in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart in your wallet. <clears throat> Lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways, submit to him. In all of your ways, submit to him. And he will make your path straight. We give because we want, number one, to obey what 
God has told us to do. Number two, to be a part in the spreading of the gospel. Be a part in ministering to the poor. Be a part in doing God's work. Not only here in our community, but also around the world. So as you give, give with a cheerful heart, knowing that God will multiply it and will bless you too in return. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for your word. May our tithes and offerings be used for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to go ahead and get back into our worship service, and uh, let's just have just a, just a time where we, we just open our hearts, and uh, we, I really want... I know even for myself, I go in each week going, am I going to be caught up with trying to pay attention of how everything is going and finding that nice balance of making sure that I'm not doing things so logistically by my music and everything up here, but where I block out what, what Jesus has for me while I'm leading worship. So let's just focus our hearts, focus our minds, and I know that, uh, that he'll speak to us this morning. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, but my story's just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. And the failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. And ooh,
come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let a rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame, and all who are broken, lift up your face. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. There's hope for the hopeless and all those who stray. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, a rest that endures. And earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. Yes, God, that is what we want for each and every one of us when we come into this place. None of us are perfect. All of us are far, far from it. But with whatever it is that we've done or said or we feel like we've just done that was 
against God, against our neighbor, against our family, whatever it may be, whatever sin we think that we have on our lives, this is the place where we can unburden ourselves. This is the place where we just give it to God, where we come here in our brokenness and everything. And God will meet us at that place. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. thing to honor those who died in defense of our country, in defense of us, in wars far away. The imagination plays a trick. We see these soldiers in our mind as old and wise. We see them as something like the founding fathers, gray and gray-haired. But most of them were boys when they died, and they gave up two lives, the one they were living and the one they would have lived. When they died, they gave up their chance to be husbands and fathers and grandfathers. They gave up their chance to be revered old men. They gave up everything for our country, for us. We owe them a debt we can never repay. All we can do is remember them, what they did, and why they had to be brave for us. Well, good morning. It is a blessing to be here with you this morning. You really cannot meet on this weekend without having a remembrance for Memorial Day, the memories of those we've loved and lost due to conflict and battle. We just want to honor them this morning before we kick off with the rest of our service. I love this image, too. It fits. Uh, whenever I look at that, I think of the old TV show MASH. Any of you guys remember that? It's what it seemed like there was always stuff laying around like this. <laughs> well, in this instance, where we're talking about blood-stained pews, though, as opposed to an, an, um, a mobile army operating room. And we started this series a couple of weeks ago based on the core value that we as a church desire to pursue redemption. We want to, the broken to be restored, the hurt to find healing, the lost to be found, and we started this all with the story of a church building used by a couple of medics in the invasion of Normandy on D-Day. And the wounded were brought there to save their lives. But while there, they, they bled on the pews. And the blood stained those pews and it's still there today. But it serves for us as a powerful reminder of why we are here. We, the church, are a place for the wounded to find healing and the hurting to find health. And just know this, if you are serious at all about redemption, if you're serious about the wounded becoming whole, then it's going to get messy. The mess doesn't start here just and leave it, right? It, we carry it with us during the week. But often the mess gets messier in here as we 
pull off those hidden bandages and we begin to treat the wounds here spiritually. So this morning we're going to get a little messy. Ready? (laughs) Now, if you've ever done anything that you're really ashamed of, raise your hand. All right. I only saw a few hands go up there, so... If you didn't raise your hand, you aren't being honest. If you did, turn to the person next to you and tell them what you did. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm just asking you this question because I'm curious. Almost, if we're honest, we've all done something we're ashamed of. What did we do with it, though? What did we do with that? Did we get caught? Did, uh, Did you tell anyone about it? Are you possibly still holding on to it? How are you doing with it now? as life has progressed. This is gonna be a fun one, uh, because this morning we're gonna talk about shame. Uh, We've had a couple of songs that really address that well this morning. Well, let's define the term shame, okay? Brene Brown says, shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love or belonging. Something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. And then she goes on to make an important distinction between guilt and shame. First is guilt is action-based, right? Shame is identity-based. Guilt is, I did something bad, and shame is, I am bad. Guilt is what I've done, and shame is who I am. And shame, church, let me tell you this morning, destroys as many believers as anything else I know. They don't know what to do with it because it shapes how they see themselves. They can't see themselves even as a child of God sometimes, someone that God could even love. And if you can't grasp that, then the load becomes too heavy and they fall away. And those of you who have not yet fallen away but are sitting there with slumped shoulders, whether you're showing us or it's just internal, refusing to make eye contact because of the shame we continue to carry, other people uh, are good at it, they wear masks. And now they are embarrassed, not only of what has happened, but now they add on to the fact that as they hide behind their mask, they feel like a fake. And it's not only only extraordinarily painful, but it's also an indicator of where we are in our faith walk. We haven't really yet trusted God to do his job. And here's one more piece of the puzzle for you. If I can't learn to manage my shame, then I don't show the difference that Jesus makes in my life. And my shame then becomes one of the things we've talked about, a roadblock for others to come to know Jesus. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to travel that uncomfortable path that leads from freedom from the pain of shame. And we're going to look again at a story. Now, you church, you've heard me tell this story before. We talked about it not too long ago. But I want you to know that it's very important to me. And I reference it a lot And this time we're going to make some different but equally important observations in this story because I completely identify with this person. And we're going to be looking at a story from the Gospel of John when we find a person that is to deal with both guilt and shame, and it's found in John chapter 8. You're familiar with it, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now let's pause there for a second. If you back up a chapter, you're going to find that Jesus is there during one of the big festivals, right? The Feast of the Tabernacles. This was a festival held every fall to celebrate the harvest. But more than that, it was about the Israelites living in tents while they were in the wilderness when they left Egypt. And people came from all over. Even those who had homes in Jerusalem ceremonially would camp out in tents that week. And Jesus uh, went outside of town to his camping spot. And at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts. This is verse 2 where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. So it's early in the morning here, but people were already gathering in the courtyard of the Gentiles in the temple. Um, And they recognized Jesus and they came to hear what he had to say. Verse three says, the teachers of the law and Pharisees brought a woman in caught in adultery. Now here's where we have to start. The woman is guilty, right? She's guilty of sin. She knew what was right and she chose to do what was wrong. Adultery is never accidental, church. (laughs) It is wrong always, no exceptions. I need to stop off here, though, and take us down an important side road, okay? Believe me, it's going to be worth the trip, I hope. Uh, There are four sources of guilt, why we feel guilty. And we ask ourselves, where does this this guilty feeling originate? 
Well, you can always track it back to one of four sources. The first one is self, right? Sometimes I make myself feel guilty. I made a to-do list today and I only get half of them done and I, I feel guilty. That's, that's self-imposed, right? Nobody else in the world cares that I didn't finish that list. Nobody knows that I only got four of them done, right? But I put myself on a guilt trip because of what I didn't do. Number two is others. Speak of guilt trips, right? Oh man, people in your life can do that to you. Some people are experts at manipulating you by guilting you because you didn't do what they wanted. You've heard them, I guess I'll, I'll get by somehow, don't worry about me. Next is, number three is Satan. The devil loves to use the guilt trip and he uses it to trip us up. He whispers it to our soul, I knew you wouldn't do it, right? You never do what you say you will. Because he knows guilt, he knows how to use it and he can paralyze you with it. And finally, number four is the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, sometimes God convicts us Hey, that is wrong. It will create a gap in our relationship if you continue to do it. It can hurt other people, so stop it. That's the Holy Spirit. Four sources, and really only one is valid, right? The Holy Spirit. And when you feel guilty, you have to assess the source, don't we? We have to determine where it comes from. And if it's not from the Holy Spirit, then we've got to learn to let it go. Recognize it for what it is, a false feeling imposing on your own spirit well for this woman that we're talking about here in this story this time it was from God okay there was guilt coming from God she was guilty she was discovered in a bed in a sexual act with a man that was not her husband and one more quick note we know this I don't have to explain it to you but our culture excuses sex outside of the marriage bed but God doesn't it's not in his plan Premarital sex, cohabitating, a fling, a mistress, each one of those, every single one of them can damage you spiritually, even if you don't recognize it at the time. You don't recognize the damage until after the fact. And church is not about pregnancy, it's about intimacy. It's about what it does to your spirit. It violates what God knows is best for you. So okay, let's go back to the story, if you don't mind. Following close on the heels of her guilt comes her shame, though, right? It has to come right behind it. She was caught. Now, if there is a continuum of shame uh, right here, from embarrassed to humiliated, and there it is, where do you think this moment fits on her scale? A blush, maybe? Did we start here with just blushing? Or where is the actual hole that I can climb inside of, right? Humiliated. No question about it. And they made her stand there before the group. Verse four says, and they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Whew. It is one thing to be naked, with somebody, your lover, whoever it was, and it's another one to be completely nude before this group of strange men, right? Caught in the act, she knew what was wrong, damaged her reputation at the least, may cost her her life at the worst. Well, that may not be worse. Uh, at least then the humiliation would end, wouldn't it? <sighs> then they dragged her out of a house, down the street, through the city, we don't know how far away the temple was from where this took place. Do you think they let her get dressed before they carried her away? Right into the temple, into the courtyard where everybody's gathering for a festival. See, shame comes from all different directions. There's the shame that grows from within. No one else has to be around to experience shame. It can grow from grilling ourselves over what we should be or who we should be or how we should be. Well, shame almost always starts with sin. But not always. Sometimes for women, for women it's often about body shaming, right? How I look. What do I see when I look in the mirror? Never meeting expectations at home, 
at work with other mothers. Am I a good mother? Am I a good lover? Am I getting everything done that other people expect of me? And for men, it's a little different. Usually, it often starts with failure. I can't provide enough for my family. I'm not as good as the others on the the ball field or the golf course or the classroom or the workplace. It is being wrong for a man a lot of times. Not doing it wrong, but being wrong. It's a sense of being defective, too soft, too weak, afraid. And all of those things grow from within. We don't need any help manufacturing these negative images of ourselves, do we? There's the shame that we manufacture, and then there's social shame. Shame imposed by those around us, like dragging us into the temple and announcing to the world how bad a person I am. It's being caught. It's being called out. It's being labeled. It's being shunned. I need to stop here and ask, if any of this resonates with you because it does with me can you feel what she is feeling because you feel it let's go one step further and identify some of the symptoms caught by those who are trapped in shame are you afraid to talk about what happened are you hesitant to admit why you are struggling do you worry others will judge you or not accept you or reject you if they knew about it let me just ask, do you, do you isolate or hide out of fear of embarrassment? Do you feel dirty or tainted, unworthy because of what happened? Whether you did something or something was done to you, it doesn't matter. You still feel unclean. Might that be true for some of you? If you experienced abuse or trauma from another person, do you still feel like it was your fault? Somehow this is on you. You think to yourself these questions, could I have stopped it? Why didn't I tell someone? If I hadn't gone there, then this wouldn't have happened. They shamed this woman, right? They made a public spectacle of her. But she felt like she deserved it because of what she'd done. Do you think you deserve to be punished for what you did? That's her. That's what this poor woman is feeling right now. Exactly. And church, I'm going to tell you this morning, that is a horrible place to live. What a horrible place to stop this story, wouldn't it be? But let's read on. Jesus bent down and he wrote on the ground with his finger. We talked about this not long ago. I don't know what he wrote. We stated before that maybe he was writing their sins on the ground, the sins of the Pharisees. And I love the thought of that. I really do. (laughs) But I think there's another possibility here, church. What What if he was bending down and writing on the ground to get their eyes off of her. Maybe he wanted her to have just a moment of relief from the judgmental scrutiny of the women watching, judging her looks, or the men fantasizing about what brought her there, all of them condemning her for what she'd done. What's going on that didn't make the pages of John's gospel here? You know, some... Some of you are living right in the middle of that right now. This sin has moved from being something she did to who she is. She is an adulterer. She now has a label. That's how others will refer to her going forward. But it's not just what others think. It's about what she thinks of herself. And know this. The father of lies. Satan himself is going to use this opportunity to convince her that she can never be anything else. Satan will seize these experiences and twist them and he wraps them into traps and we become convinced that this is who I am, not just what I did. Satan has done that to me. I I have an addictive personality and that's played out in my life in all kinds of different ways. Luckily, I've never been into something that was illegal or anything like that, but certain times in my life, I've gotten too obsessed, too involved in something that was unhealthy for me that got between me and my relationship with God. And I've cycled through dozens of unhealthy addictions throughout my life, and I, and I currently still struggle with the addiction of food. And Satan takes these things, he's taken these things in my life and pushed me into some dark and lonely places, places of doubt and shame 
and anger and frustration and all of those things, they can consume you if you let them. Until I finally came to a place where I realized that I couldn't control everything simply through my own will. I was not wise enough. I was not strong enough. I started making changes in my life. I, I went to counseling. I, I sought out accountability groups. I attend a, a, a group called Celebrate Recovery, which is a ministry for people who are letting go of things that can get between them and their relationship with God. And through that process, I now I don't see myself as weak. I don't live from day to day a life full of shame. I see myself as healing and getting stronger through the power of the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit wants is to use this time of, of shame. He wants to use it for conviction. God speaks into our souls telling us that it is sin. But the goal for God and for the Holy Spirit is the, to a decision that will bring us closer to God. Satan is going to use that very same thing and try and make it something for condemnation. Negative and destructive thoughts that drive us away from God. I am defective, I am damaged, I am broken, I am flawed, I am dirty and impure and disgusting. Surely God doesn't want anything to do with me but to judge me. I want you to be sure that Satan is working very hard behind the scenes in this very story, just like he is in yours. So what, what can I do reasonably? If that's me, if this is where I am, what can I do to get rid of the shame? Well, let's walk down a path that leads from freedom to shame. The first thing we want to do is to identify it. Is what I feel guilt or shame? Guilt is what I did. Shame is about who I believe I am. If it's guilt, what is the source? Is it myself? Is it other people? Is it Satan? Or is it the Holy Spirit? Because we've said before, only one of them is valid. If it is from any of the others, then recognize it as inappropriate and throw it in the trash. If it is sin, then we need to confess it. Own it. Don't blame, don't rationalize, claim it. And then we need to accept God's forgiveness. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Thank God for the promise and hope that it brings. Grace and forgiveness kills shame. Then forgive yourself. It's not who I am, it's what was done. Because they are distinct and different. If God can forgive you, then you can too. We talked about this last week. I don't want you ever to think that your standards are higher than God's in forgiving yourself. Forgiveness is a gift that you give yourself to set you free. And include somebody else. Be careful who it is, okay? A friend, a counselor, they have to be somebody that's trustworthy, but let them know that you've carried this alone for too long. It can be healed, but it can't be healed if it's not shared. The less we talk about it, the more power it has over our lives. Secrecy and silence feed shame. And then relabel it. I was embarrassed, I was humiliated, but that does not define me. Change the way that you view yourself. I am bad indicates that I can't change. It's inherently who I am. And that's just not true. Jesus can make you a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, old things are passed away. All things become new. And it all comes down to trust. Do you believe Jesus? We're gonna turn back to the passage here in verse seven. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now again, I don't know what he wrote, but church, what I do know is the effect that it had. Verse nine, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. But this story isn't about the guys that left, is it? It's not about the shamers. It's about her. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, she said. 
then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. This is what I want you to remember right here, okay? What sticks out to me is that Jesus offered this forgiveness before she changed. Neither do I condemn you. There is no change, only shame. But Jesus forgave her. She had nothing to offer, only her brokenness. But Jesus said to her, that's a fair trade. Your brokenness for my forgiveness. Use that grace as a catapult to move you into a different way of living. Go now and leave your life of sin. How does that even work? <laughs> I mean, we read it and we struggle to understand how it can happen, but here it is. And remember this, as long as you focus on you, you'll never, you will always be vulnerable to shame. The way to heal from shame is to shift the focus from what I am to who Jesus is. I wonder how the story ends, right? I, I wonder what happened to the woman from that day forward. I, I don't know. But I su suspect that that day was a game changer for her. It would be for me. Will it be for you? In this place, these blood-stained pews you see before you, will you walk out of here today weighed down by your guilt and shame? Are Satan's claws dug so deeply into you that you just don't have the strength to let it go? If that's how you feel, I hope you can see that today this is a lie. He wants to keep you chained to your past. He laughs when you don't speak up for yourself. When you can't find the words to say, I'm sorry. Satan's winning battles in this room right now this morning. And you're bleeding on the pews and he's saying, keep it hidden. If you realize that shame is holding you back, it's keeping you from becoming the person that God has planned for you to be, then I invite you to come down here during our invitation song, and I invite you to come up here and sit on our bloody pew with me so that we can pray with you. If the Spirit of God is saying, I've already forgiven you, but I, I want to start walking with you in light and wholeness, then come up here so we can pray that we can join you on your journey. And if you just can't let it all go, to claim Jesus as Lord of your life. I pray that you would do that here this morning, today. Come up here and let it all go and find your peace that only you can be found in Him. The blood is real. His blood was shed. And we hope you'll let us help you heal yours this morning. If you have something to lay on this bloody pew, come down and join me as we sing our invitation song this morning. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging. 
Tonight, there will be no youth group tonight, uh, but stay tuned. There's going to be a bunch of awesome stuff coming this summer for our youth. Um, our community meals and Wednesday night program ends this Wednesday. Uh, we are planning lots of fun activities over the summer for that group as well. Uh, if you are currently or would like to join the First Impressions team, it's been really cool if you've enjoyed the changes that we've seen as we've come into this place. It's been pretty incredible what they've been doing. There will be a meeting uh, on June 8th at 6 p.m. right here if you want to be a part of that. Uh, so I encourage you to do so. Um, as you leave today, we ask also that you pick up a food bank bag which is this green fella right here. We have a bunch of them hanging right out there. You probably saw them when you came in. Um, just uh, bring your bag back next week, uh, filled up. Uh, there's a list on the front of uh, things that, that would be good to put in the bag. It's a, it's a good guideline. And this is a great opportunity to serve our community and help meet those needs. And for any more information on all things on what's happening at C4, please visit the coquilachristian.com uh, slash events. With that, let's go ahead and come to our Lord with one more song. Let's have a great time as we leave this place, and uh, let's just enjoy the rest of, the, of this uh, holiday weekend with our friends and family. Joy still comes in the morning. Hope still walks with the hurting. If you're still alive and breathing, praise the Lord. Don't stop dancing and dreaming. There's still good news worth repeating. So lift your head and keep singing. Praise the Lord. Joy still comes in the morning. Hope still walks.
walks with the hurting If you're still alive and breathing Praise the Lord Don't stop dancing and dreaming There's still good news worth repeating So lift your head and keep singing Praise the Lord Amen. Be blessed, church. Have a great week.